explain to them that the more carbon dioxide we increase uh, we have in the atmosphere, the warmer the water is going to get. So let's kind of look at the state of this problem. So the emissions in the Republic is around 60 million tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent. Now we say equivalent because of course in Ireland we have a whole pile of methane and a lot of that comes from farming, from agriculture. So around 66% of our farming, which is a third of our emissions, is methane. So farming is our biggest emitter here in the Republic, right? Also transport, electricity and heating are all big problems as well. And um, when we look at Northern Ireland, it's just over 20 million tonnes, that's for 2018. I'm sorry, the kind of formatting just uh, didn't go quite as well as it wanted it to. But again, agriculture, 27%, it's a similarly scaled problem across in the whole island. So I think when we do think on whole island approaches, there's an awful lot that we can learn uh, from, I suppose, the two different countries, you know, as to how we're going to decarbonize this. I mean, transport as well, 20% in the Republic, 23% in the North. When we look now, I think it is interesting to look at the per capita emissions. You know, we can, it's we talk about China a lot, but we can see that China is a whole lot less than us actually, and Nigeria is only a fraction of both of our uh, emissions. And it's important to remember that, that we really are, um, that when we talk about other countries developing, they are so far behind us when it comes to emissions. And that it is, a lot of the time, it is because of, I suppose, the relative comfort that we all live in and everything that we have in life and our cars and our buildings and all that there that causes emissions. But it's important to keep that context when we're looking at it. And that there's an awful lot that these countries that are very small at the minute in the future are going to grow to the level that we need them to when they develop. So we need to make sure that we can help them develop in a very clean fashion. So that's the sort of the state of the problem. But when we look now, what is this going to, what's this going to do to us? So when we look at the sort of the uh, global impacts of it, um, at two degrees, with 400 million more people suffering from water scarcity, we have 143 million climate refugees. Um, so, uh, like we'll be on track for at least six meters of sea rise when we start when things in Greenland uh, soft start to melt. Oh, sorry, I'm just looking at people. Can people see my slides now? Sorry, I'm only after seeing that now. So, sorry, Ben. Yes, yeah, so I can see them now. I think we just have to maybe uh, if you can't see it, uh, just check the settings for Microsoft Teams to mm -hmm. make sure that it's clicked on focus, which allows you to see your slides. Sorry, Ben, for interrupting you. No, no, sorry. Uh, sorry, I wasn't looking at the chat there. I just clicked on it now. So if anyone has any problems they got there, let me know or if I need to repeat anything. So like I said, so two degrees of warming is is very serious problems. And, and yet that really is one of the best case scenarios. I mean, when we're looking at four degrees of warming, severe drought across 40 percent of the planet, double today's amount, 400 million international refugees, billions of people suffering dangerous heat, 3 billion people suffering water stress. That is, I think, catastrophic is the only word that we can use to describe it. And when we think on the impacts, we here in Ireland and the island are going to be relatively lucky when we look at the impacts that we're going to face. And then that there again frames it that the countries that have emitted so little compared to us, like we see in the per capita emissions, are going to be impacted a lot harder from these here, from these impacts. So when we look at Ireland now, uh, we look at, so in my book, I split it into kind of weather and sea, because that's sort of how we've split it up, I think, and how it's been reported in the past. We're looking by 2050 if rivers increasing by 20% in the winter and reducing by 40% in the summer. And summers in 2050 have been 2.5 degrees warmer than 2008. By 2070, which isn't really that far away, it's, you know, it's within my lifetime, winters will be 25% wetter and 4% warmer. Summer will be 38% drier and five degrees warmer. So, and six and seven summers will be warmer than 2018. And that's relatively about 38% drier than average. And I mean, 2018, I remember it being a very nice summer. It was great, I was at the beach a whole lot. But that year, you know, potato yields fell by nearly a third. Average farm income fell by 15% as farmers had to pay nearly 50% more on feed. So when we look at the people that are most vulnerable to impacts in Ireland, it is really agriculture that I would see as being the most vulnerable group 
to the impact of climate change. And then I think that we don't acknowledge that enough, maybe when we talk about it, or at least it's not acknowledged enough by the people that sort of a lobby for agriculture that we're going to need to reduce emissions, but we're also going to need to start to prepare uh, for these people to continue things like irrigation and stuff like that there that really I think would be hard for people to imagine now. So as well, we look at the sea, that's sort of been, I think, one of the, the things that we always think about when we think of uh, global warming. With In the Republic, with half a metre of sea rise, which isn't really that far away, we're looking at losing a thousand hectares of beaches, and this doubles with two metres of sea rise. Obviously, that's not great. We all like going to the beach. But these provide really vital defence systems for, you know, coastal areas. Like an area that I write about in the book is Mahari, and that's a small village It really is protected by a beach and sand dunes, and that there's just been slowly chipped away at by the sea. And that's happening all across the country, and it's going to continue to happen, and it's going to get a lot worse. Agriculture land is going to be vulnerable to flooding, and that level triples at two metres. Again, this is a reoccurring thing that agriculture is really vulnerable. And the erosion is going to continue, that's the same, you know. And we don't, I think, think about that enough when we look at the local impact of climate change. How does that impact our infrastructure? roads, houses that have been planned now, will it be safe for them, maybe not in 50 years or 70 years, but what about 100 years and 150 years? You know, will it be, you know, we have to start thinking like that there. And we're heading for two metres of sea rise by 2100 at the minute. So we're really, I don't think, taking this seriously enough. And again, with the levels of warming we're heading for, we're going to lock in a whole lot more sea level rise way into the future, which again is something that we're leaving. I think we often think of we're leaving it for this current generation to fix, but we're leaving that problem for generations way down the line to try and fix. With two metres, we're looking at 1.5 billion in insurance claims on land flooded by the rise in sea. That's just in the Republic. Like that just shows the scale of the damage that we're going to get with two metres of sea rise. So an interesting thing that I found when I was uh, when I was writing the book was the efforts going on at the minute uh, in Belfast City to try and protect against this problem. So the scheme is sort of a mixture of a wall sort of around the, the river and around the sea in Belfast, and it's going to cost around £18 million. And, you know, I think an awful lot of people would look at that and think that it's very expensive. But, you know, the council have estimated that the level of flood risk will leave damages at £250 million, an additional £87 million for things like employment loss. This is it is unfortunate that it's come to the, to this stage. You know, really, we want to be spending all of our money on just reducing emissions. But from the impact that we've already locked in by getting to one degrees of warming, we're going to start facing these impacts. So while we would like at the minute to be just focused on reducing emissions, we're also having to keep one eye on the impacts that we're going to face. But this is, I think, a really interesting idea, and it shows very clearly that this is going to cost us an awful lot in the future, and we're going to have to spend now to avoid, again, leaving it to future generations. So, as in it's, I suppose it's very, you know, we can get caught up an awful lot of the time in the in the terrible impacts of it because there's a lot to think about, but we do have an awful lot of opportunities here. And we, um, I cover this a lot in the book, you know, what are, uh, as to how we can decarbonize all our different sectors. So when we look at electricity, Electricity we have huge potential for wind energy in Ireland here. We've actually one of the highest levels of potential in all of Europe for offshore wind energy. And but the problem is, of course, we all know this renewables aren't perfect because of their kind of fluctuating nature. We need to find a way to store this energy for long periods of time. And if we don't do this, then we're gonna get stuck with using fossil fuels like gas to try and keep that sort of 30% of the energy. Uh, we need at the minute in the Republic. We need have 30% of the grid being kept by what's called synchronous generation. So we think of that as being generators. So it's sort of power plants. But we need to be able to store this renewable electricity and use it later so that we can fully decarbonize the grid. If we don't do that, then areas that are going to use a lot of electricity in the future, things like transport and heating, are not going to be decarbonized then. So batteries are good, but they're not quite at the efficiency that we need. And I think a thing that I'm very interested in is that we can generate hydrogen and use it as a fuel. And I remember doing this in school, I don't know if other people do, but if you know you take an electrical charge to water and one wire you get oxygen and another wire you get hydrogen. And it is as truly as simple as that there, that you can use this hydrogen then as you would use fossil fuels, but the only emissions you get are water vapor. 
And again, we need to do this because if we don't, then any other sector won't become carbon neutral. That I think that we're not pushing enough to get this here down to completely zero carbon. But it is changing. So at the minute, in, there is now uh, a hydrogen facility planned for Port Harrow. And just today, actually just this morning, I just read about it this morning, ESB are going to... Uh, sorry, just in case there's anyone there, there's not a mute, just somebody's phone ringing. Sorry, I don't worry at all. It's still happening to everybody, I think, after a year in lockdown. Um, but uh, ESB are actually now working on a green hydrogen scale, and Airgrid as well for the Republic are going to start working on hydrogen. But this isn't going to be done to 2030. But as we can see here with this energy company that is working in Cork now, this is definitely where people think the future is going to be. So I think it's important now uh, that we move on, that ESB and Airgrid move on it. Eamon Ryan has said that it is more a problem for them to sort it. And while that has the benefit of not maybe making it a political football, it also, I think, reduces momentum in that area. So electricity, so like I said, we need to decarbonize that, right? But what else does this help us with? There's actually a whole lot more uh, savings we can get from this. 1,300 people die of air pollution in Ireland every year. And I don't think... And I think that's just a staggering statistic, really, when we think about it. And it also causes you know, health problems like asthma. It has a negative impact on education. And we also spend a huge amount on this. We spend 5.7 billion on fossil fuels every year. And it's subsidized to the tune of 2.6 billion euros. So when people say that you know, fossil fuels are good because they're cheap, they're not really cheap. In 2018, wind energy saved us 280 million. I and mean, we've incredibly ramped up our wind energy production since then. And I think that there's sort of a political side to this as well, that, you know, maybe when people do give out about climate action, you know, this should be the argument that maybe if you don't care about climate, but it has you know, us using fossil fuels has a whole lot of other negatives that we don't consider enough. And as well, when we look at uh, electricity generation, it's going to give us a whole pile of jobs uh, that you know, I don't think we're focusing on as well. I mean, 14,000 jobs in offshore wind, potentially, it's just staggering the scale of it. And that'll happen if we produce at the scale where we're sort of exporting out to Europe, whereas a lot of them we're sort of importing at the minute. And I think an interesting thing about this is I read a book recently, Moonshot Economics, where it talks about the sort of Apollo moment in American history. And in the book, I talk about the Shannon scheme and how it was sort of the new Irish state uh, had to create a hydroelectric dam on the Shannon uh, to, I suppose, you know, generate the amount of electricity we'd need. I think it's fascinating that the first uh, real genera generation of electricity in Ireland's history was hydroelectric. So we started off, you know, carbon neutral, and then we just got a whole lot worse from there. But it cost an awful lot. It cost £5.2 billion. And the state's budget at the time was £25 billion. Today, that'd be like the Irish state going and spending 15 billion, you know, on one project or on one thing today, which I don't think people could imagine them doing. And it was constructed by a German company. And I found interesting that the penalties for late delivery uh, really got the thing moving. And there's only a relatively very small cost overrun. And uh, this book that I'm reading, Moonshot Economics, I think it's very interesting if you want to check it out. It's definitely, um, there's a whole lot that we can learn. Uh, from moving in big projects like this here. So anyway, that's uh, electricity. Uh, when we look at transport, I think that's something we think about a lot, you know, electric cars sort of become synonymous with climate action. But no matter how much we talk about it, I mean, Northern Ireland, there's only 4,000 electric cars. Uh, and that's for nearly 2 million people. That's pretty much nothing. Public transport needs to be better, but of course it also needs to be carbon neutral. The photo there is of the new electric buses in Glenvay National Park just out the road, which I think is really interesting. It's great to see, I think, the Irish government get involved in it. That kind of spending, I think, will make companies invest more in Ireland and then it might make it cheap enough for private companies to want to get in. Hydrogen fuel cells can be used for boats, you know, for things like ferries and stuff like that there. And planes is a problem because planes are so heavy that the amount of batteries you would need to fly a plane would just fill the plane there'd be nobody on it so when we are capturing hydrogen we can actually combine that with co2 to make a hyd uh, hydrocarbon which is pretty much just what fossil fuels are so it's 
we that is the only I think the only way we're going to decarbonize those areas. We're just going to have to generate these alternative fuels. But I want to talk about and when John spoke to me about coming on, uh, he said, you know, maybe to me talk about my own personal experience. So I want to talk just for a minute about transport in rural Ireland. And this here is a picture just down the road. I walk to work and this is the main road in Terman. And like, as you can see, there's not a whole lot of space. It's fine for me. I can walk and I can, you know, stand in, but I wouldn't want my granny to walk on it. I wouldn't want my, you know, young cousins to walk on that. But yet that's the only way for, you know, you to move around if you're walking. So I think that we need to make it easier for people to move around their own communities without using cars. People talk about, you know, maybe rural Ireland is too reliant on cars, of course. And Eamon Ryan got a lot of flack for that there. Um, but when you look at, say, the public transport at the minute for rural Ireland, I mean, that's the buses for me to get in and out to Letterkenny, which is just in the road, really. But I don't think that that is really enough that if, you know, the people in my family need to get to work or to college or to whatever it is, it makes it very difficult for you to do that. You know, there's an awful lot of sitting around and waiting and all that there. And even if you do take public transport, and this is a map here of Terman, and the bus will go through the main road. It'll drop you off anywhere in that yellow line, but you need to get home then. And, you know, that'll require walking on roads like the one I just showed you. And you might have your school books, you might have your shopping and things like that there. It might be pouring rain and you might have to walk a mile you know, so even if it is cheap, even if it's clean, if you have to walk a mile home, you're probably not going to take public transport. So there is this sort of fundamental problem with public transport in rural Ireland that is going to be incredibly hard to overcome. That last mile problem is just a significant difficulty to making people want to use public transport. Now, heating is another one we talk about. So. I think heating has become a sort of a, a cultural thing in terms of climate action in the same way that we talk about cows, you know, it's become this really polarized thing. So has turf, I think, a lot of the time and how people heat their homes. But I think an interesting thing, we have to renovate houses to be more energy and efficient that and we have to ensure that new builds are energy efficient enough. That is something that's being done. Electric heat pumps can be used for most rural houses and I've seen them in action. They are they are actually brilliant. And district heating can be used for towns and cities. This is a really interesting thing that I found that you sort of generate the heat in one place and then you pipe that out to other houses. So this has been done actually at the minute in Tala. It's been worked on. It's the first large scale district heating scheme in all of Ireland. It's going to save an awful lot of CO2 and it's going to use an awful lot of heat that is coming from a data center. Actually, the amount of waste heat that is generated from industries in Dublin city would be enough to heat the whole city anyway. So it's going to be really interesting to see what this does. District heating is actually 53% cheaper with your capital costs if you're heating um, an estate, you know, if you're building an estate and you're heating it with district heating, then it will be to supply them all with heat pumps. So now I think that if this government is going to plan, you know, a big spend on housing, this is going to be something that's going to help it get cheaper. And I think anyone involved in climate has seen this graph. It is the uh, International Energy Agency's uh, estimations on how to get to zero carbon by 2050. And it says that 50% of heating demand needs to be met by heat pumps by 2045. So it, that is how we're going to generate heat for one-off housing in a, in a clean fashion. That's just going to have to be the way we do it. So agriculture. So for the Republic, 11 million tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent come from cows. So we need to reduce the amount of cows or at least stop the increase in the amount of cows and reduce their methane output. There are interesting things in this here, uh, you know, things like seaweed or antibiotics. Uh, we need to reduce nitrogen fertilizers. I don't think we talk about nitrogen enough. As many like 3 million tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent every year. That's more than our international aviation emissions. You can do that by better slurry spreaders. You can do it by using protected urea instead of your main nitrogen fertilizer. And that's actually better. It comes at a saving. It's around uh, eight euros 30 per tonne of carbon dioxide equivalent saved. So it actually is going to help. Silver pasture is something I was recommended by the Irish Climate Change Advisory Council. So it's where you combine trees and agricultural land. Um, and that there, and their 
saying that you could probably store 7.2 tons of carbon dioxide per hectare that it's on, you're never going to get agriculture, you know, to be carbon neutral without offsets. Cows aren't going to stop emitting methane. That's just not going to happen, nor any of the other animals that we have. So we're going to have to make sure that agriculture can offset the rest of it while reducing what it can. Now, an argument that is made a lot is that, you know, uh, we have the most climate efficient in Europe, but it's actually the other way around. It's the least climate efficient. And food isn't about efficiency. You know, I, I know that there. Um, but unless we fix this, the whole, you know, we're the best at it, so we should be allowed to do it, doesn't really hold up. You know, some models show us being, you know, having the least amount of greenhouse gases for milk and dairy. Others show us has been one of the highest. So we're definitely not, I think, this really efficient green country when it comes to agriculture that we think we are. So negative emissions then is, I suppose, how we map up the rest. Things like agriculture, things like heating, they're going to be really difficult to decarbonize uh, completely but they're going to be really difficult to decarbonize by 2050. So how can we reduce our emissions through, I suppose, naturally? We can plant forests on suitable ground. That's very important. Scotland has found out, you know, in the past few years, the impact of planting on bogs. These forests need to be just kind of taken down and to let the bogs be restored. You know, Chagas estimates that we could store 2.1 million tonnes of carbon dioxide you know, a forest in 7,000 hectares per annum, and that's 45 uh, euros per tonne of carbon dioxide equivalent stored. So again, that's actually relatively cheap compared to other things. There is, we, we can, you know, we really can decarbonize using forests. We can allow areas to rewild. This is good for carbon storage. It's better for water management than just sort of mass planting forests, and it's better for biodiversity, which is another problem that we're having, and that's probably a talk on its own. We need to save our bogs. Our bogs emit three and a half million tons of carbon dioxide. Again, that's more than our international aviation emissions. It's just this huge source of carbon dioxide when really it should be the opposite. It should be a sink. So we need to restore them to the carbon storing ecosystems that they are. They're relatively slow at storing carbon, but they are actually very good at it. I mean, 75% of our carbon stock in Ireland is stored in our peatlands. So they are really good at it, but we have to re-wet them. We have to fill in the drains that have been dug and that are being dug to allow them to store carbon. Now, something that maybe I don't think we talk about enough, and I don't actually talk about in the book because I think it's something that's hard to do on, on a national level, is technical negative emissions. And I think an interesting topic in that is Stripe Climate, and they're looking at projects that can store one gigatons of carbon dioxide. And, and that is, I mean, the International Energy Agency estimates we're going to need 7.6 gigatons of carbon stored. And we're not going to be able to do that all entirely with land. It's just not going to happen. So to see these kind of projects working is going to be very interesting. But we're going to need to make sure that it's not been run by oil and gas companies that might use this carbon dioxide to just find more fossil fuels underneath the ground. But it's definitely something that we should be thinking about, I think, as climate activists or as people in, within a climate community. And a big problem that I talk about in the book when I talk about exported emissions, uh, these two areas, but sort of a heavy industry and our plastic. You know, steel and cement is nearly a tenth of global emissions. Plastic is three to four percent of global emissions. And this is nearly all from industrial heat. You know, that basically we can't get that industrial heat that we need at the minute without fossil fuels. Now, it's looking like we can do that there with hydrogen. But again, when we don't have that sort of these trial projects. I think there's only one trial project of this happening in the world right now. We need to get that moving so that countries that then do develop can develop using these clean technologies that we make. So that's the uh, the topics uh, there. That's kind of a rough overview of what I cover in the book. Um, if you ever want to contact me about anything, you can get me an email or you can shout at me on Twitter at Harkin underscore Ben. Um, that's kind of one of my favorite pastimes. Um, I hope you might have picked up something from that there. It's just sort of a rough overview of what's covered in the book. Um, and I hope that you do get the book and you might learn something from it. That's wonderful, Ben. Can I say that's both comprehensive and uh, inspiring. Uh, too often in the climate and sustainability area, you get a lot of lists of all the problems and there are many and multiplying, but 
it's also good that you're able to provide some uh, of the solutions that are out there. So thank you for that. So folks, we're, we have a you know about twenty minutes or so for Q and A and discussion with uh, with Ben. That's an excellent presentation as well. And by the way, you 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 know how to use PowerPoint properly, not death by PowerPoint, Ben. Um, <laughs> so if if you want to ask a question, can you just use the raised hand um, facility, and I'll come to you or if you can't uh, access that, just put your question in the in the chat box. So perhaps while you're you're thinking, I can maybe uh, start us off. Um, so of, of all the solutions, Ben, that you you outlined, which in terms of priority do you think um, that government and society should go for? I think that our, our big thing has to be renewable electricity because like I say, you have this fundamental problem that if you don't have zero carbon electricity, then everything else that you run electricity on isn't going to be zero carbon. And I think that that's something that we're not, you know, we're not pushing these storage systems because they're expensive at the minute they are, but unless people start working on them, you know, and start producing them at scale, they're not going to get any cheaper. So I think that that is, Going to be something that we need to we need to work on a lot faster, and that we should be placing more emphasis on. That's great. Thank you. I have uh, uh, Niall. Do you want to come in there, Niall? Um, th thank you very much, Ben, for your wonderful talk. I thought it was um, really impressive. Um, just had one question: um, How ambitious do we want to be? Thanks very much, Niall. Uh, thanks for your question. That's that's a great question. Um, I think. As was that I in the book I try not to put in too many sort of hard targets other than you know we should be decarbonizing by 2050 like the government has planned and I think that that is obviously it would be great for us to have the ambition to decarbonize by 2030 or you know as soon as we can but I think you run into the problem of um I think it leads to an awful lot of shuffling around of emissions you try and you know if you place it too soon then sectors aren't going to be carbonized soon enough and you're going to try and get things you know heading under you know like for example aviation emissions are heading at the minute things like land use are heading at the minute and things got there happen i think that 2050 um is a good aim to have but i think we can do it a lot earlier i think that we can decarbonize by you know early 2040s if we work hard on this here now you know, i think that when i suppose you know, i think of the republic when we have a, a green party in that you know, this is the time to set that ball rolling, so that governments can't come along the next time and then you know wipe it away. That you need this fundamental uh, fixes. That's great. Just before I let you in, Jenny, I think you're you're absolutely right there, Ben. Which is why it's so vital to have climate change legislation because that mm -hmm. then sets down the the targets and so on. Otherwise, uh, there can be the prospect of different governments coming in and and changing in priorities of that. Uh, having that legislative uh, direction of travel and, and security is, is very vital. Uh, Jenny, do you want to come in there? Hi, Ben. That was an absolutely smashing presentation. Thank you for that um, really interesting perspective, because I don't know if maybe I haven't looked in the right places, but um, hearing the story from rural Ireland is actually a really important part of this whole picture. So really interesting. Um, I was just wondering, because you are presentation focused quite a lot on um, our technical challenges and I think a lot of our carbon use and mitigation measures are quite technical and you know things like electric vehicles represents a massive change if we were also like you're saying coupling that with with decarbonized energy systems um, but I think uh, part of what has to meet that is changes to people our sort of behavior as behavioral aspect to that um, and that can be, you know, you mentioned briefly a little bit about public transport, having rights of way for people to walk. Um, but also, you know, one of the big things you highlighted at the start was uh, our agriculture impact. And uh, in particular, uh, you said, you know, the methane from from eating beef. Do you think that uh, our behaviors, you know, how to what extent are they important? in our decarbonizing in, in Ireland, in the island. Um, and do you feel hopeful that we are going to get there if you think that's something we need? Thank you very much, Jenny. That's, that's two great questions. 
So what role do so sort of what role do personal choices have to play in it? I think it's obviously very important that people do understand that the climate action, that it is a personal thing, that it is something that affects all of us. But that there is a, a limited scope that, you know, that you do individually yourself. Um, you know, even when we talk about things like recycling and stuff, that there is a, a limited impact of what your one person does. And I don't say that to discourage people. It's very important that, you know, we play our role in this, but that sometimes that, that can be done at the expense of thinking about the larger systems. You know, will me, for example, walk in to, to work or say walk in here or whatever, you know, have an impact when we can think about the amount of money that this government will spend this year on fossil fuel subsidies. I think that it is that young people or people in this generation care so much about climate action that we really want to do something about it. And I think it's such a big issue we can feel powerless. But it, it, I think it is more important that we have the system level change uh, for, you know, for practical reasons, but also for political reasons as well. You know, it's it's very hard to be popular and tell people that you have to walk, you know, everywhere. Um, but it's it's a tough one. You know, there's no it's not black and white. There's a role for everything in it. I, and then for the second one, I am hopeful. I think we will. I think we will decarbonize. I think that more and more people are starting to um, I didn't realize that this is a problem. It's something we should work on. You can see that among politicians. There is no real mainstream politicians that regularly say that climate change doesn't exist. There, you know, it's instead changed to it isn't as much of a problem as we think it is. You know, Michael Mann talks about this. It's very interesting. Um, but uh, so tactics are changing because more and more people are realizing this is a problem. So I think I am hopeful. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong. But you know, I think it's it's nicer to be hopeful anyway than to be pessimistic. Uh, amen to optimism. Absolutely, you're 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 quite right. Um, so, folks, any other questions or or comments to Ben? Yes, Louise. Uh, hi, Ben. Can you hear me? Okay. Yep, I can hear you. Hi, that was a wonderful presentation. I am interested in your views and getting farmers on site and agriculture. And I think we have an opportunity for them to actually be possibly like the heroes in terms of environmentalism and thinking about them being paid to rewild like possibly, you know, they have a 30 by 30 initiative here, like 30 percent of land should be rewilded or reforested. So um, if they were to be incorporated with that, I think that's one of the solutions. I'd just like to know because I know they feel quite attacked and concerned about it. So just want to know your thoughts on that. So I, in the in the book, in the chapter on agriculture, it, it opens and closes with uh, really my best friend, Jamie. Uh, he's he's doing agriculture in college. His grandfather's a farmer. He will be a farmer. Um, you know, and this is his life. And, you know, you listen to him and he definitely, and like you say, he feels attacked. You know, I think that, yeah, sometimes there are, you know, environmentalists that, you know, it is an, a very unfairly negative to farmers. But as well, I think it's a byproduct of how we've sort of reported on climate action. We tend to talk about it as sort of two sides, like we do for a lot of stories. Um, and also, I think that maybe if, if you don't farm, and this is a problem that me and Jim come up with, that it's, it is very hard to understand that people aren't going to want to rewild their land because generally that's seen as a waste of good land. If your you know, father or grandfather you know, spent years of their life trying to get a field in great shape, you're not going to want to plant trees in that. That feels like a waste. It feels like going against what the work that was done. So you have to, I think, understand that. And that's only done by listening and bringing farmers into it. And I think that there's an important thing that we can learn from this. I think we, we listen to farmers and if farmers on Twitter or whatever say climate action is good. We say brilliant, you know, farmers on our side. If farmers say if farmers is, if climate action is rubbish, we just say they don't. They don't know, you know, we kind of discount views that uh, don't agree with ours. But yeah, like I say, you know, when you have things like um, rewilding, uh, restoring their bogs, uh, you know, agroforestry, farmers can be, but it requires communication, I think, at a government level. You know, it's got to be a Minister for Agriculture thing, not a Department of Climate Action thing. That's great. Thank you, Ben. Um, Amanda. Thanks, John. 
Ben, well done. That was a fantastic presentation. Um, great to hear more about your book and, and to, to appreciate the urgency of the issues we're facing and possibilities for action. Um, I suppose following on from Louise's point there around um, farmers, particularly we see that in the north in relation to the climate change bill, um, but we also see where the media is setting up this climate versus agriculture debate. Uh, and that has become very prevalent in some of the mainstream uh, commentary on, on farming uh, and on climate action. So rather than giving space for farmers to support climate action. So I suppose moving on from that, I heard you say there about, well, we need to have government level interventions. But also knowing from knowing where you're from and, and, and that rural space that you're in um, and from a summer background myself, to think about how do we create and how do we strengthen more community sharing, particularly among rural communities, about what the possibilities are. So on one hand, your thoughts around how do we have those non-formal um, or informal learning around climate action and possibilities for farmers and for rural communities around climate. Uh, and then more broadly, you know, you, when you and I talked this morning in advance of the launch, we were chatting about climate scepticism and um, again, best and press and how do we more broadly have these conversations on climate. So the solutions you're talking about, how do we even get to the point where a lot of adults, and we already know a lot of young people understand these issues, but a lot of adults don't. So how do we create uh, awareness of this more broadly? So I'm particularly interested in the skills sharing, the knowledge around positive climate action within agricultural communities, but more broadly, how do we help adults learn about this and, and move towards climate action? Yeah, that's a good one. How do we? Um, well, I think the main one would be, I think everybody in Ireland probably buying my book and reading it. I think that would be a critical part of us learning about climate action. Um, but so I think an important thing is, I think we have treated climate action and it's been treated as something that exists in and of itself. It is a Department of Climate Action thing. It is a climate activist thing. But it's really climate action, uh, climate, it is like air. It just fills whatever space it is in. So this is something that should be asked of every politician and of every local politician. And I think that sometimes it can be done a disservice in the media. And I don't like saying the media in broad strokes, but but I said, you know, our local, you know, why are local politicians not taking the task when they're asked about air pollution outside of a school or a new road going in there when it might be, you know, uh, impacted by erosion? That we have to learn that this is something that exists and it affects everything. And that then you know, we have to act according to that there. I suppose, how do we get, you know, adults themselves to act on it? Again, it's that early one of, there's that balance between personal responsibility and government responsibility that it's, it's kind of hard to come down on. And I think that it is changing in the agriculture community, I mean, from things that I see, but also I think that the Minister for Agriculture in Ireland, Jeremy Conlogue, has some very interesting ideas. Uh, one thing was a pilot programme in sort of low input pastures for farming. So that's going to be, I think, really fascinating to see how that there goes out. And if we see ones, maybe a similar thing in agroforestry or civil pasture, it'll be interesting to see then, you know, how that's taken up. But it has to be with the sort of financial net that is done. In the West, subsidies make up around 105% of farmers' income. So, you know, you can't, it is understandable how people will react negatively if they think the boat's going to be shaken when there's just so, you know, when you're literally on a knife edge. That's great. Thank you, Ben. Um, if, there, if there's somebody else wanting to come in there, uh, let me see. Uh, Jenny, do you want to come back in or is that a, what the, a legacy hand? <laughs> yeah, no, I had another question. Sorry. Um, yeah. Ben, I was just wondering, I can't remember what you said at the start you were studying at university, but it wasn't something climate related. Can you remind me what it was? Uh, software and electronic systems engineering. You're on mute, Jenny. OK, there we are. Sorry. Um, so you've now written this uh, pretty epic sounding book on climate change, and it's come with a big mandate for lots of change. And you're studying electronic software engineering. How are you going to combine these things? What's next for you? What are you going to do with all of this information now? Me and Amanda were chatting earlier, and she asked me the exact same question. And I'll give you the same response I gave to her. I have absolutely no idea, and if any of you have any idea, you can let me know. That would be greatly appreciated. Uh, no, listen, um, I've always loved tech and technology, and I think if I didn't write a book about climate action, I probably would have wrote a book maybe about the polarization 
of and misinformation of social media, you know, that's something that really interests me. So maybe it will just be something on that. I'm very much a part-time climate activist. That's uh, something on the side. Um, but uh, I don't know, it'll be interesting now to see uh, what can happen. But again, I have, I'm making this up as I go along here. I have no idea what I'm doing. If any of any idea, let me know. I, I, I do. Just before I let Mary in there, I think, Ben, speaking as a former and recovering politician, I think you'd be a fantastic public representative for rural <laughs> Ireland. But anyway, uh, think about it before you make uh, your mind up. Uh, Mary, you want to come in there? Uh, last question, and then we'll, uh, we'll close up. Okay. Folks, so. All right. Can you hear me? We can yeah. indeed, yes. Uh, grand. Hey, Ben, thanks very much. That was so inspiring. You know, I think whenever you kind of look at the data and think, Will we ever survive this? But it's for people like you and other, I think, young champions of climate change that come out with such a clear uh, voice uh, uh, advocating, you know, that we can do this. It's just amazing. I was really interested. I'm definitely going to get the book. I'm from Castle Wellen, and we've got the Dolman's Climate Action Group down here. And the question around farmers and engaging farmers has become such a controversial one and the way you raise it I think you know talking about your father and his grandfather and beginning to see beginning to understand the difficulties you know that farmers really do have in, in kind of beginning to understand what we're in and, and and the way to go has been really really good and one of our ideas is at the last Saturday of every month in Castle Welland we have kind of you know we bring and share you know plants vegetables and things like that and hospitality and we're thinking of actually putting up you know like tents and having conversations the way you're talking about about with farmers how to engage people not to try and change their minds but you know, just to begin to talk about this and I do think we need champions like you talk about your your friend, your farmer champions. So if we could get a couple of champions that can show the way, you know, how this can be done, uh, you know, and everybody gets it gets win win. I think climate change is like everything that's controversial will just get caught up into what you describe as the yes or the no camp. And, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. those spaces to have real conversations and people to, to kind of say, I don't understand this. How does this go? What does zero carbon mean? You know, all of those kind of conversations are so, so important to have. And um, yes, yeah, so I think that's kind of, I don't, it's not really a question. It's, well, maybe it is then. Maybe it is, could you come down to Castle Wellen some Saturday afternoon <laughs> that we're having one of these conversations? I've <laughs> to a few people. Um, yeah, no, that's, uh, it is some great points there, Mary. And yeah, like I love what you are doing about having these conversations. And I think it is that it is that more nuanced conversations that is needed than what is now, which is mainly just sort of two talking heads. So that's great to, great to see it's happening. Fair play is for actually going out and actually planting things. These are far better than far better than me anyway. Um, but my grandfather's no. a farmer, but I don't think I've ever actually no, done that solid. You're doing, you're doing more than your part then. Yeah, you're doing your part. <laughs> That's wonderful. Well, that, thank you. No, there's some great points in that there, Mary, and definitely, you know, that sort of communication is what is what we need. Um, but I don't and know now. I don't think I have the, the time to hear. Buy a few books. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's what I want to hear. Yep, buy them books. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, listen, Brilliant. folks. I I got to bring this to a close. That's a fantastic ending. Thank you, Mary, um, for that. Ben is available to do weddings, uh, baptismal <laughs> uh, confirmations, uh, and also trips down to the castle. I'm going to sing the so, song now. I think we're going to just going to maybe pass over to to Amanda. You're going to make some final comments, Amanda. Well, I suppose if all that remains to be said is thank you very much, Ben. This has been a, a great um, event, but I think it's been a, a wonderful tribute to the work that you have done. You know, you've really. You are a role model for other young people. You're a role model for all of us about getting off our bums and, and taking action and offering concrete solutions. I think your, your book does that really well. So thank you all. Well done. You've done Chairman Pride. You've done Johnny Gall Pride. You've done us all. <laughs> I should have had the big Johnny Gall flag up in the background. Like, thanks very much. Lisa. Thanks for having me. This is brilliant. It's been great to get to talk to people about it. Thank you so brilliant. much. That's thank great. you, Ben. Take care, everybody. Have a great afternoon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.